It's a good thing about this three, two, one. It takes a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> scroll down on the other side. Let's scroll up. Spirit. When we um, move here right now. Good evening, everybody. Who we have online with us tonight so far? Hank, Carlo. We have a quarrel. We're going to get started. Does that work for you? I can see that. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Your word is alive and active in me. Most high God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all that is, all that was, all that will be. The Almighty, Abba, Abba, Abba. Gracious Father, first we ask you to forgive us for we've fallen short of your will and your glory. Oh God, restore us, shine your face upon us that we may be saved. And we say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy, thank you for your love. Thank you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Peace, joy, and healing. We thank you for inner strength, courage, and purity. Father, we thank you for expansion, abundance, and awareness. Now, God, our Father, we ask that you touch us tonight. Open our hearts, souls, and minds to receive of you. Speak to me, speak through me, that I may do your will, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let us rejoice in the name of our Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. amen. How are everybody doing tonight? Hello, Lakeisha. All right. So, hmm? all right. So, I am the way. That is the subject of our uh, lesson tonight, and it's dealing with peace. Shalom. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. John 14, 1 through 14. Now the author writes, in, in our church we invite people with pressing needs to come to the altar for prayer. Every week the altar is lined with people who have troubled hearts. Other Christians pray with them and for them. Our cry is that Jesus will touch us and that we will receive his peace. Now the question is, who do you want around you when you're hurting or distressed? And how does this person bring comfort to you? Who do you want around you when you heard of distress? Last uh, Monday, we talked about when Jesus wasn't where Lazarus was when he died, and Mary and Martha was like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And we talked about sometimes how, having our, how we feel when our best friend's not there when we think we need him. So who is it that you would like to have around you 
when you in that circumstance where you feel like you got to have some help. And how do they help you? So everybody's perfect, huh? While y'all thinking about it, I'm going to ask uh, Deacon Jason if he would go ahead and read the scripture for us, please. August 17, right? 14. No, 1 through 17. 14, I apologize, all right. And it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are mansions, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And that where I am there, ye may also, you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye you know. Thomas saith, saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how saith thou then? Show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am the Father, and the Father, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. This is a very, <clears throat> very familiar scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. So, when you find yourself in a distressed situation, who is it that you would like to be around you? And why? What does that person do to bring comfort to you? No, that's the group discussion.
Thanks, Adam, for the use of this phone. Yeah. If you think about it, if you have a significant other, you've been with somebody more than 10 minutes, in a relationship, that should be somebody that you look at when you find yourself hurting or distressed. But what happens when that person that you're in a relationship with does not bring you that peace that you look for, that you seek? What do you do? Amen. She anchors me in trouble times, all right. So what happens when what happens when your significant other is not that person? Who do you turn to? Who should you turn to? Because the truth is, sometimes your significant other is not who you need to turn to when you're distressed. Anybody have any heartaches or things on their heart and mind right now? You're sure. Thank you, Hank. Church family God. All right. All right. Jesus' followers, the disciples, felt like uh, the world was falling apart. Jesus just told them he was leaving, and they couldn't come with him. The path to cross was for Jesus and his own, his own by himself. In the backwash of their sorrow and distress, Jesus speaks words of peace and makes an astonishing claim. Don't let your hearts be troubled. With compassion, he tried to settle down the men that had been closest to him for the longest amount of time. He tried to calm their fears about him leaving. Amen. Amen. What words of comfort did he offer to give them confidence? First he said, believe in me. Hey, Joy. First he said, believe in me, believe, all, it, it, believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, place your full trust in me just as you would the Father. And we, because we are unified, I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. Second, he told them that he had a heavenly real estate waiting on them. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I go away to prepare a place for you. According to the Jewish custom, the father would always add rooms to his house for the newly married son. In other words, when you belong to him, when you belong to the family, you don't have to worry about some place to live because it's already taken care of. And once we belong in Jesus' family, he establishes already that in the mansion, we got some place for you. All you got to do is believe and come on home. All right? So... Think about times of stress and sorrow in your life. And then think about what the disciples might have been feeling. What is it like to have a troubled heart? What is it like to have a troubled heart? There's so many things going on right now 
in, in our little world that something somewhere is bothering us all the time. Amen. You know, for some people, what's bothering me might seem like nothing. And then what I look at that's bothering you may seem like nothing, but it makes a big difference to you. And in the case with this Jesus telling the disciples he was leaving, that made a big difference to them. Somebody you walk with taxes, do tell you go pick up a fish and pay the taxes. We um, causes anxiety and stress and the like. Yep. Anxiety and stress. Uh huh. What else? Anybody else? Bob, when I look at this, and, and as Hank Hankton said, anxiety, stress, think about sorrow, and uh, we went through this once before, uh, realizing that it's that trouble that no matter how many nitroglycerin pills you take, it ain't going to help. That heart trouble that steals your sleep and you can't rest. Amen. <clears throat> wait, on, wait on me physically. Yes. Wait physically. Sadness because so many of us don't know Yeshua and it's even tearing in my family. All right. Tearing your family apart. All right. So then I'm hearing some isolation and loneliness mm -hmm. that comes up in there because nobody understands what you're going through. Amen. Or we get to a point where we don't want to bother anybody with our issues and we start to bottle things up on the inside and we keep it to ourselves because we feel like don't nobody care. All right, <clears throat> good observations. So, looking at verses 2 through 4, what will, what will Jesus be doing when he leaves his disciples? We already touched on that a little bit, but what, what would Jesus be doing when he leaves his disciples? First, so that he can, so he can accept. Oh, I forgot exactly how it said, but basically, he's going to prepare a place for us so that when he returns, he can bring us with him. Jesus promised, "I will come again and take you to myself," and that return that Jesus is talking about is the rapture, the time when he will return to receive his saints and take them to heaven to stay, not for a short visit, then this will happen prior this will happen prior to his return to earth to establish his millennium kingdom. Alright? Going back to heaven. Amen. Amen. In what ways are Jesus preparing you to be with him in his father's house? In what ways is Jesus preparing you to be with him in his father's house? the Holy Spirit back. All right. What else? He sent the Holy Spirit back, but um, is it legal for the Holy Spirit to be here?
So the Holy Spirit is here. What does that mean? What do we have to do with the Holy Spirit? Getting me dressed in my wedding clothes. Okay, the Holy Spirit is back and you're getting dressed in your wedding clothes. So, sound like the uh, groom is coming and the bride is getting prepared. But I don't hear nothing about no relationship. You plan a wedding and the Holy Spirit just came back and the two ain't joined together yet. When we going to join you and the Holy Spirit together? You can't have a wedding without a bride and a groom. Am I right? Let it lead and guide us. All right. So, Evangelist Kennedy is talking about a relationship. In order for something to lead and guide us, we have to open up and let it in. If we don't open up to receive then we cannot be led or guided. And in order for a wedding to happen, there has to be a relationship where you are on one accord so you can have a happy marriage. Otherwise, it's not a marriage. You just got two beings together. But if you're going to have a marriage, you have to be two beings together on one accord, with one accord. All right? So in order for this force to get on one accord, what needs to happen in our day-to-day -day relationships? Being led and being guided. What, what, what else has to happen while we're being led and being guided? Can you stay in a relationship with anybody just being any kind of way? How many of you wives going to accept a husband that don't pay bills, come home whenever he feel like it, treat you any kind of way he want to, and um, just not a good husband? How many of y'all going to accept that? How many men are going to accept a woman that does the same thing that I just said? Communication. All right. So there's communication. And we communicate through prayer and suppli supplication. That means we open up our heart, open up our mind to receive what the Holy Spirit is instructing us in order to be led and guided in the right, guided in the right direction. So we're being purged, we're being prepared, we're growing stronger in faith, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in him. Would you agree with that? Would anybody disagree with that? Thomas tell us about what was troubling his heart. Verse 5. Thomas asked, well Thomas said, he wasn't sure. Jesus promised his disciple that they knew the way where he was going. However, Thomas said he wasn't sure. How can we know the way? It was as if he was, he had said, you haven't given us a map, Lord, but Thomas had misunderstood the way. is isn't a path, it's a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what was, what was Thomas's feeling? What was Thomas saying 
his heart saying at the time when he asked Jesus that question? I told him that's what you were asking. I was looking at this other question. That's okay. You just put the question right there. That's it. No. What does Thomas' question say to you about what was troubling his heart? Look at verse 5. What does Thomas' question say? His heart's troubled that he'll be lost. Hmm? His heart is troubled that he'll be lost. Not knowing where he's going and then not knowing if he'll know the way, he fears that he'll be lost and not be able to find Jesus again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like both of y'all answers. She don't understand. He's saying lost. Basically, he's saying I'm lost. Yeah, I'm lost. Why was he lost? What was making him feel lost? What had Thomas gotten accustomed to? Having him there. Thomas, I don't think he really understood. For Thomas. Yeah. Don't think he really understood. All right. Don't think he really understood. Thomas was feeling lost. What was the question of Jesus last night all? How long have I been with y'all? Y'all don't know. Thank you, Sister Kennedy, having Jesus with me. That's the answer I was looking for. Thomas had got accustomed to having Jesus with him. Now Jesus is going away. What am I going to do? What are we going to do? Lord, you've been taking care of us. You've been watched over us. You've been guided us. You've been taught us everything we need to know. Are you leaving? Imagine a child when we going out and we don't tell them where we're going. Think about your children if you got children. The time that you went out and you didn't tell your kids where you were going and they looked at you. Mama, where are you going? When are you coming back? How long are you going to be gone? How come we can't go? So just picture, just picture Thomas and the disciples in that same mode. What you mean you leaving? Where are you going? When are you coming back? Uh, how come we can't go with you? You know? Then, let's move on. Jesus, how is Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the light received in our society today? How do people, how do people, how do people accept that? I am the way, the truth, and the life. How do people accept that today? No man gets to the Father except they come through me. But nobody gets to the Father unless they come through me. Amen. Fear the unknown. Fear the unknown. Yeah, when well, we don't know. And that, that was it. Thomas is, that was Thomas in a nutshell. He didn't know. So now he's sound like he's terrified. It might. So how does our society deal with the claim Jesus made? I am the way the truth and the life. We know that Christ is the universal access point to the Father. 
I don't care how many Hare Krishnas, Muhammads, Buddhas, David Koresh, Jim Jones, Heaven's Gates. I don't care how many of those names you call. And please don't utter my name. <laughs> don't utter my name. It will get me in trouble. I don't care how many names you call. Unless you say Yeshua Hamasiah, Jesus the Christ, there's no way you get into the Father. In other words, if he don't endorse your check, you ain't got no money in the bank. Lots of people don't understand Jesus being the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm. Glad you said that, Sister Kennedy. I was reading something today about um, the Messianic Jew versus the Jew, the, the Jew, the Judaic, uh, that's the word, Judaic Jew. The Messianic Jew accepts Christ and the tri, the Trinity, whereas the Judaic Jew just says, nah, you don't have a relationship with God. And there is no such thing as, that's not the Messiah. The Messiah hasn't come yet. So we still waiting on the Messiah. So until we understand that Jesus came, died, rose again, and is sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting to be told to come back, we are just in a waiting stage. But if folks don't believe that, then they like Thomas. Lost and confused. All right. There's a lot of conflicts in that in today's society. Yeah. Jew I mean, uh, I mean well, I mean look at the Catholic religion, for example. They've got different people, different saints and all that that they pray to that they go to that is supposed to help them to get to the Father rather than just go straight to the Father to Jesus. You know? And it's not just them, there's all kinds of other religions that people today are receiving not accurately. So they're not receiving the proper word for Jesus. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yep. It makes a lot of sense. And so his claim being received in society today is mixed because there are so many claims being told. And that was supported by Hank just said the same thing you said. Oprah says there are that Jesus is one of the ways. Okay. And 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 <clears throat> I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, you can say he is one of the ways, and you can say that uh, Yahweh is a God, and there are several gods, but then there's something you got to understand. That Yahweh is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the God of Gods. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. No other way to get to heaven but through him. There may be other means, there may be other things you can pray to, but until you go to the right door, until you put in the right combination, have the right secret knock, that door is not going to open. So we can say that I pray to the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother. Yeah, you can pray to Jesus' mother and hope she put in a word with you for you with the son. But somewhere along the line, you need to have a relationship with Jesus himself. You can talk, you can talk to my son until you blew in the face. But until you ask me for what you want from me, you ain't getting it. And that right there is the biggest part of the battle today is all these people that were brought up believing all these different things but the right thing and so our battle is an uphill battle trying to get them to understand follow and believe the true word versus what they were taught so it sounds like what you're telling trying to say is we need to get them prepared yes sir or so they'll be like them five virgins that knocked on the door what I'm, what I'm saying it pretty much is we've got our work cut out for us. Yes. Yes. 
Amen. Well, what is our responsibility? Each one of us is like, well, let's just call it what it is. He's the part of we the clay. He's the part of we the clay. He already knows in his mind what we are. Mm -hmm. He already knows in his heart who's who. What is our job? Plant seeds. I'll plant a seed. Somebody else will come along and water. But God said he's going to harvest. Mm -hmm. Our job is to let people know who he is. Live a life that shows that and have a testimony to back up what you're talking about. All right. How would you answer a person who thinks it is narrow and intolerant to believe that Jesus is the only way to God? The very thing we was just talking about. How do you handle a person like that? And let's use Oprah for example. She has a viewership of millions and millions of people. People listen to what she says. And she says that Jesus is one of the ways to get to heaven. So how do you deal with that person who has that influence and who thinks it's intolerant and narrow-minded of us to say that, no, the only way is through Jesus? How do you deal with that? Do you compromise the gospel? I had to encounter somebody like that. The first, first and foremost thing I would do is pray, pray for, for the courage, pray for the, uh, uh, I guess the proper, pray, pray for the proper guidance on how to approach, address, and talk to the person, because. Anybody can just walk up to somebody and just say, well, this God's this, our God's this. You know, and then you just have a continuous conflict back and forth. Whereas I would pray for the wisdom, for the guidance, and for the courage to show me where in the Bible I can go to talk and address to this person about Jesus. So you're going to be a gardener? That's how you want to put it, yes, sir. So you don't want to just drop it on stony ground. No, you don't want to just. Throw you're not going to throw it. You're not going to throw it amongst the thorns. Never. You're not going to just leave it for the birds to gather. Like with like with our boys, when we when we talk to them and we teach them. Between Evangelist Kennedy and my wife and myself, we try to teach them properly. We try to tell them everything that is according to what the Bible says. And just like Pastor said. If they don't know it, or if we're not sure, we tell them to look it up and mm -hmm. see it for yourself. So in doing so, we're trying to, I guess as you say, gardeners, we're trying to plant our children in fertile soil so that they have an opportunity to grow, to mature, and nurture God's Word. Okay. All right. So with that, being, with that point being made, but you've got that steadfast person that says it's intolerant and wrong of you to try to force them to think the way you think. Then what? I can't make you change your mind. No, you can't. What the scripture say? Like the dust. When you come across that person that refuse, that's absolutely refused, and you've prayed, you've asked for guidance, and you've done your due diligence, it's up to them to accept or reject. One of the key things we have to remember, one of the lessons we had this week was the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. And who hears the shepherd's voice? His sheep. And if you're not of this fold, and if you're not one of his sheep, you're not going to hear. They're not going to hear you, no matter what you do. 
So once you've done your due diligence and done your best, dust the dust, shake the dust from your shoes, go about your business. And the rest is up to God. You've tried to plant the seed. You've even poured water on the seed. Went back and did some weeding. Way more than you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to plant the seed. But you went and got some deep gardening done. Fertilizer, cleaned up, fixed up around the fig tree, make sure couldn't nobody steal it. Because you want to do what's right in your father's eyes. But once you've given them the opportunity, once you've given them the word, I can't make you. I can't make you. Put Jesus' response to uh, Philip's questions in your own word. What was Jesus saying about who he was? What was Jesus saying about who he was? Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? You still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us, excuse me, how can you say you show us the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. What was Jesus? Use your own words. Say it your own way. Nobody? All right, so now Philip took his turn to be dissatisfied. Show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Philip wanted to be like Moses. Who got to catch a glimpse of God and see him for himself? But he didn't understand that fully revealing God the Father was exactly what Jesus had come to do. No one else ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is God himself and is at the Father's side, has revealed himself to them. In other words, Philip was asking for what he already had and didn't know what he had. He wanted to have a Moses experience when he had a better experience than Moses ever got. He walked with God incarnate, but he wanted to see God and looked at him every day that they were together and didn't know who he was. So when Jesus responded to him, I, 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 I am who you're looking for, bro. You, you just don't know what you're looking at. 
you got gold in your hand and you think it's not what it is. But it is what it is. You need to accept what it is. All right. In what ways did the disciples or Christians today do greater things than Jesus did? In what ways did disciples do greater things than what Jesus did? Jesus works Jesus works confirmed his divine identity but he affirmed to his followers the one who believe in me also do the works that I do and I will and he will do even greater works than me All right, now he wasn't talking about us being equal to him as a God no way no how Rather, he was talking about the scope and the impact of what we would do. Mm -hmm. He was talking about our ability to, well, what we're doing right now, transmit through technology to be able to talk to millions and billions of people at one time and continue to show our faith in what we're doing and the belief in uplifting his name. Jesus operated within a smaller area. We have a larger area to operate within and carry the word and carry the gospel. Okay? <clears throat> In verse 13, is he giving us a blank check to get anything we want from God? Is he giving us a blank check? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Mm -hmm. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. So is he saying, I'm just going to bless whatever you ask for? Whatever, whatever? I think it's whatever, whatever. I think... Hold on. Okay. You love your baby, don't you? Zion? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Help him out a little bit. Help him out. <laughs> Can Zion? Well, no, I'm just saying the baby. Okay. Can Zion do anything that he wants to do in your name? Why not? Why? He's not old enough to do some things. <laughs> He's not old enough to do some things, okay. So what type of state does it need to be in order for Zion to use your name? Or to get whatever he wants from you? How old is Zion now? Six? Seven. Oh, boy. Zion is seven. So if he asks you for something that maybe uh, Jaden or, or um, David should have, you going to give it to him? Why not? Not appropriate, most likely. So, I was thinking that, I just didn't know where you were going with the question. <laughs> but, that's, but that's it. That's it, exactly. If we're not asking God for something that is right, if it's not in his will, if it's not going to bring glory, if it's in his will, amen, sis. You ain't getting it. If it ain't in his will, you ain't getting it. Just like Sister Kennedy said, if it's in his will, you ain't getting it. Do you will for Zion to drive your car at seven years old? No. 
Do you will for David to drive your car at 15 years old? No. No. So what's the difference? Why would Jesus give us a blank check to just go around and say, hey, Jesus said I can do it. No, it's got to be it's got to be rightly connected to the will of God. If it ain't right, and you know it ain't right when you ask. Amen. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> Let me see if he's gonna do it. No, he ain't gonna do it. All right. What can we learn from this passage to help us stop having a troubled heart? What can we learn? To help us stop having a troubled heart. Can we learn that there ain't no troubled heart, that there is not no troubled heart that is too troubled and too great. Instead of bottling up and keeping to yourself or being ashamed, take it to take it to Jesus. Take it take it to our Father. Pray, ask for guidance, ask for strength, ask for blessing and healing, and he'll take your troubled heart and heal it. Hmm. I like that answer. Like that answer. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't stop praying. Know that he is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. You are who he says you are. You can do all things through Christ as long as your word, his word is alive and active in us. Man, this is a good lesson, and I, I'm going to try to word things in a different way, so because I want us all to understand uh, we got very few answers tonight. Uh, uh, even though we share this scripture read so much uh, uh, at funerals, but this is a happy occasion. Uh, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Uh, uh, in other words, what we're looking at when we look at this is that God, uh, Jesus is here and he's saying, trust me. So I'm going to reverse all of this and tell you to uh, uh, look at your homes. When you got ready to get married, you trusted and you believed in whoever you was going to marry. You believed that they was going to get a house ready for you. 
uh, 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 the uh, Old Testament, they call it a betrothal uh, section. In other words, it's the waiting period. So when we are waiting on that particular day to be married, uh, uh, your, 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 your wife, your lady, you're at home with mom and daddy, and the man is going out and he is getting a house ready. When he gets the house ready, then he will come and retrieve you from your parents' house into a house that he has prepared for you. Here, Jesus is doing the same thing. He is leaving earth, this barren land, and he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So what he does is he goes to his father's house. He's pulling out his carpenter tools, and he is building a room especially for you. When your husband buy you a house, he bought that house for you with you in mind. That is your mansion. I, I, I'm, I'm even going to call our earthly house a mansion because you have it fixed the way that you want it. When you walk in there, you decorate. And he giving us a guarantee. He's saying that I'm going to come back. How many people do you see get married and he's got his own house and the wife's still over there with mom and daddy? That don't work. You're going to go back for your bride. And you're going to have the best that you can. And then whatever your bride asks for, within a reasonable mindset and a reasonable frame, you're going to do your best to get it. Amen. That's why when he asks, he, he says, whatever you ask in my name. So if you ask for a Rolls Royce and I've got a Volkswagen budget, guess what? you're going to get the best that I can afford. And that's going to be that postcard. Hmm. So our Father's not going to give us anything that we cannot handle. So ask yourself, how many husbands or wives is going to go out and buy a Lamborghini or Mercedes Benz when you can't even make the payments on a Volkswagen. That's what it's all about. That's what it's telling us. It's getting us ready. This is a happy moment. Uh, and that he's coming back. He has prepared a place for you. You ain't got to sleep on the streets. You ain't got to sleep in no tent. Uh, and truth be told, if I make it to heaven, I, I don't mind sleeping on that, on them golden walkways, golden streets. <laughs> but that gold is road material right now when you, when you get there. But he's preparing for us. So, I'm going to ask a lot of you, know, I, 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 if any ministers listening, they, some of them may get upset at me, but take this out of your funeral reading mindset and read it for the blessing that it is. Amen. 
Amen. Trust in him. He's going. But you see, when even right before you agree to get, get married, and your husband or are, are going to be husbands across town trying to get things ready, he he he's just like uh, uh, Jesus. He's got somebody watching over you. That friend of his that keeps popping in, they didn't, they didn't pop in just to be popping. They pop in to be nosy, to make sure that everything is all right with you. Our Father has sent the Holy Spirit by to make sure that you have what you need but all within his will no devil we all ask for a million dollars but if I give you a million today it's going to be gone tomorrow because you can't handle it he gives us what we need not what we want so trust in it believe reread this and then look at how you got married to your husband gentlemen to your wife how you took them how you prepared a place and you said trust me I'm going to have a decent place for you to stay. I pray that we all got something out of this. God bless each and every one. All hearts and minds clear? Hearts and minds clear? Do we have any more prayer requests? Let us go to our Father in prayer. Most High God, we thank you for allowing us to come together. We thank you for the time we spent in your glory. We thank you for your feeding tonight, Father. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be in your presence one more time. Father, we thank you for all that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for going away to prepare a place for us. And we thank you for the promise that you're coming back to receive us into your very own. Now, Father, we ask you to look at Sister Penny tonight. She's requested prayer. She's asking for strength. Father, in the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. we ask that you build her up. Give her the strength that she needs to go through whatever it is she's going through. Whatever is troubling her heart, Father, give her peace. Shalom in the name of Jesus. Father, through by the faith, by her faith, by faith, Father, 
we ask that you bring healing, peace, love, and joy. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Good night, all. God bless.